Good evening and welcome to the Midland Board of Education regular scheduled meeting for September 10th, 2012. Madam Secretary, would you call roll, please? I'd be happy to. President Mall? Here. Vice President Wasserman? Secretary Baker, Treasurer Ole? Here. Member Branstad? Here. Member Gordon? Here. And Member Kaminsky? Here. We have a quorum, and with that, we'll move into our consent agenda. Is there anything anybody has questions of or would like removed from the consent agenda at this time? If not, we'll go through it briefly. Um, consent agenda 2.1 is the minutes from the Monday meeting on August 27th, 2012. 2.2 .2 is the district-wide capital uh, projects previously approved uh, is 2.2. 2.3 is the following persons have recommended for employment uh, for 2012-13. 2.4 is the following staff members have announced their resignation effective dates as, as indicated. And 2.5 is the approval and request to authorize payment for the following legal bills. Move approval of consent items 2.1 through 2.5. Support. <coughs> Moved by Mr. Oler, supported by Dr. Kaminsky. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Consent agenda is approved. While we have had no formal request to address the board, now would be the opportunity for those in the viewing audience here at um, the administration building to approach the podium if they'd like to make a comment or address the board at this time. Seeing none, we'll close that opportunity uh, to address the board. And move on to the presentations of uh, the board and it's a recommendation for action by Mrs. Klein uh, for the tax resolution. Yes, and although we have a great deal of information in the board agenda, I think I, in lieu of repeating it, because the entire resolution has to be read aloud with a roll call vote, uh, I'll, I'll let Ms. Baker handle most of that. I'll just say that this is something that we need to do every year at this time. We have to notify the County Board of Commissioners of the tax rates that we intend to establish for the 12-13 tax year. These would be the rates that appear on the bills that go out on December 1 and then again uh, on March 1st or uh, I guess M December 1 and July 1 of next year. So these are numbers that are in our budget and we routinely do this but it's important that we have this done before the end of September. Thank you. Okay. So with that, this is... Baker. Certification of the 2012-13 fiscal year taxes. Whereas this Board of Education was authorized by the electors of the Midland Public Schools on May 3, 2005 to assess up to 18 mills of the taxable valuation of the school district for 10 years, 2006 to 2015 for the general operating fund subject to the limitations of Article 9, Section 31 of the Michigan Constitution of 1963 as amended and whereas Section 1211 of the Revised School Code as amended provides that the Board of Education of the school district may levy 18.0 mills of the taxable valuation of non-homestead property within the school district for school operating purposes except that commercial personal property is exempt from 12.0 of the mills and that principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, and industrial personal property are exempt from such millage levy. And whereas the revised school code further provides that the supplemental millage rate, which may be levied by the school district on principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, and industrial personal property may not exceed the lesser of 5.62 5.6523 mills, that being the cap millage rate for the school district as certified by the Michigan Department of Treasury, or the millage rate which will, when added to other revenue of the school district, provide revenues equal to the foundation allowance of the school district as determined in accordance with the revised school code and the school, State School Aid Act. And whereas the revised school code further provides that if the number of mills from which industrial personal property is exempted is reduced under this section, then the number of mills from which commercial personal property is exempted shall be reduced by that same number of mills. And whereas Public Act 38 of 1999 being MCLA 211.39 requires that millage rate assessments be rounded down to four decimal places 
And whereas, based upon information now available, the millage rate to be levied on principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, and industrial personal property of the school district for the 2012-13 school year in order to provide for the full foundation allowance amount to the school district is 1.9509 mills. And whereas, in accordance with revised millage rates for the 2011-12 school year, as determined by the Michigan Department of Treasury in a communication dated May 10th, 2012, the corrected number of mills available for the district to have levied on homestead and qualified agricultural property for the 2011-12 school year is 1.5903 mills. And whereas the tax rate of 1.5909 mills levied by the school district on principal residents qualified agricultural qualified forest and industrial personal property for the 2011-12 fiscal year resulted in revenue that was $1,111 more than the amount which should have been received by the school district under section 1211 of the revised school code. And whereas section 1211 of the revised school code provides that if a school district levies millage for school operating purposes that is more than the limits of such section the amount of the resulting tax revenue surplus may be d subtracted from the school district's next regular tax levy, requiring in this instance a decrease in the mills which the district could otherwise levy for the 2012-13 school year by 0 0.0006 mill. And now, therefore, be it resolved that there be spread on the 2012 tax roll a tax levy on the taxable value of non-homestead property of the school district of 18.0 mills for the general operating fund and resolve further that the exemption for the principal residence qualified agricultural qualified forest and industrial personal property be reduced by 16.0501 mills so that there be spread on the 2012 tax roll a tax levy on the taxable value of principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, and industrial personal property of the school district of 1.9499 mills for the general operating fund. And resolve further that the exemption for commercial personal property be reduced by 4.0501 mills so that there be spread on the 2012 tax roll a tax levy on the taxable value of commercial personal property of the school district of 7.9499 mills for the general operating fund and resolve further that if the revenues produced by the above levies for operating purposes result in revenues exceeding or falling short of the limits specified in section 1211 of the revised school code as amended such difference may be made up in the school district's next regular tax levy in accordance with such section and resolve further that the clerk of the city of Midland and the clerk of each township within the school district be and hereby is authorized and instructed on behalf of the school district to assess and spread the amounts and only those amounts required by the above mills on the 2012 tax roll. I'll move approval of that. I'll support that. <laughs> <laughs> we support you reading it, Lynn. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Move uh, support. Moved by Mr. Oates, supported by Mrs. Branstad. Um, it's a roll call vote. And uh, do we have any questions or any comments before? <laughs> if not, Madam Secretary, a roll call vote. Mr. Malt. Yes. And I, yes. Mr. Foley. Yes. Dr. Kaminsky. Yes. Mrs. Gordon. Yes. And Mrs. Branstad. Yes. And Mr. Wasserman is absent. Thank you. You have your resolution, Mrs. Klein. With that, we'll move on to curriculum and instructions. And Dr. Kaminsky has a committee report, please. Yes, we did uh, meet last week, uh, the first week of school, uh, for the curriculum and special services uh, uh, study committee. Uh, present was myself, uh, Lynn Baker, Yvonne Gordon, Carl Ellinger, and Kathy Ellison. Um, we went over the district priorities for 2012-2013. Dr. Ellison distributed a chart of priorities for elementary middle school, high school, and the district for 2012 and 13. Overall levels, there is a focus on closing the achievement gap, technology, common core state standards, and extending the IB program. Other priorities for each level include elementary, 
a full day kindergarten, middle school, closing central middle school, and writing across uh, the content areas. A new tech program, and at the high school level, uh, WCA, a five year IP, DP evaluation, and a new tech program. Uh, we talked about the new tech program. Dr. Allison introduced the district's exploration of a new tech program at Midland Public Schools and introduced members of the New Tech Planning Committee, uh, Pam Castle, Penny Miller Nelson, and Randy Shadig. Janet Greif is also a member of the Planning Committee but cannot attend to, um, to another obligation. Penny Miller Nelson provided a review of the key pillars of the New Tech program. Number one, teaching that engages. Um, PBL or project based learning creates lifelong learners when uh, curriculum is relevant contextual, uh, creative, and shared. PBL promotes the attainment of 21st century learning skills, such as collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and reflection. Number two, technology that enables embedded uh, web-based tools and technology enrich the learning experience and keep everyone connected. All classes have a one-to-one -one computing ratio. Number three, culture that empowers uh, facilitators, referred to as teachers, they're referred to as facilitators in a new tech program, and instead of students are referred to as learners, uh, own the learning experience which creates a culture of trust, respect, and responsibility. Penny described the events leading to an investigation of a new tech program as an option for our students who need this type of environment for successful learning. Her summary included researching program success, attributes of the program, locations of our visits, and how many people have visited these sites or participated in the visits. Uh, she also recapped the reflections of uh, following these visits. Uh, Randy Shadig presented to the group a 2012-2013 process map that captures the key dates and benchmarks the planning committee has identified for potential impl implementation of the new tech program to begin in the fall of 2013. Page two. It's rare for our committee to have two pages, but we do today. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Pam Castle then discussed why new tech for MPS. Uh, the new tech program will create another option for learners that will uh, first increase student engagement through the use of PBL or project based learning. Uh, number two, provide students with a small school environment in which trust, respect, and responsibility are emphasized. Number three, focus on 21st century learning skill development that is essential for student success after high school. Uh, number four, utilize business and community partners to increase the relevance of student learning and projects. Uh, five, focus on STEM or science, technology, engineering, mathematics, content, and skills. And lastly, provides an opportunity to compare a project-based learning to our current structures. The committee, member, committee members express appreciation to the Planning Committee for the in-depth summary of the new tech program. Mr. Ellinger facilitated committee discussion on the impact and financial issues during the last segment of the meeting. Our next meeting is September 8th at 5 p.m. at the Administration Center. Thank you, Dr. Kaminsky. Dr. Ellison, would you like to add anything to that? Kind of a lengthy meeting for a CASA meeting. It was exciting. It sounds exciting. I mean, but how lengthy was it? Let's talk. How lengthy was it? <laughs> it was. It was very engaged. We didn't keep track of time. We probably didn't beat the FFO yeah. meeting. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> so, thanks, Dr. Kaminsky. So, moving on uh, to Mr. Ole with a uh, FFO meeting, uh, committee meeting. We had an equally engaging meeting, and I think uh, we're all going to put in for overtime pay for it. I think I think we're in the neighborhood of three hours, weren't we, Linda, something like that? But i got to tell you, for the three hours, and somebody mentioned, they said, I bet you're not going to miss three-hour meetings, are you, Rick? And the truth be known, I will. I will. I think it was one of those meetings where I think the discussion, the dialogue, the debate was really uh, was really exceptional. It really was. It was a really good meeting. So let me kind of read through it then because we covered a lot of ground. Um, Mrs. Klein gave a preview of the audit results that will be presented at the September meeting, and she distributed a chart showing the history of changes in fund balance and net assets since 2000, and explained the role that grants and the seeking fund have played. In November 2001, the district entered into a 20-year agreement with the City of Midland to jointly fund and maintain the playground in Chippewasee, and the agreement contained a provision for early termination that requires Midland Public Schools to reimburse the city for a prorated share of the costs, and since we no longer own the property, we sought legal advice on our options and have determined that it's in our best interest of the district to exercise the termination clause, and the cost of the district is likely to be no more than $10,000. Uh, Mr. Ellinger provided an update on the expiration of implementing a new tech program. I'm sure some similar things to what the other committee heard. Projected costs and possible funding sources were discussed at, at great length, I might add. As part of a continued conversation of how best to fund capital needs and program improvements, the committee examined um, several topics. 
Uh, Mr. Saberin and Mr. Sobel, who are both here tonight, did, uh, by the way, a great job, a great job of presenting to us a three to five year vision for technology upgrades for MPS. The goals are to equip students to remain competitive and prepare for the 21st century workplace, improve learning outcomes, and extend learning outside classroom walls. Mrs. Klein distributed an updated list of future capital projects originally prepared by Mr. Casas, who's also here tonight, or he was. I could have sworn I saw him. <laughs> um, it includes projects that had initially been included in earlier sinking fund proposals, as well as newly identified needs. Greater Midland Community Centers uh, really co recently coordinated an extensive study of the aquatic facilities serving Midland County, including the Midland Public Schools pools at Jefferson, Northeast, and Dow High. Mrs. Klein, who represented the district throughout the study, reviewed the comments and recommendations made regarding our pools. And Mr. Ellinger reported that we're moving forward with plans for the Cobalt Community Research to conduct a survey this fall. The committee had previously participated in a conference call with Cobalt in March 2011 and felt that a community survey would be useful as the board makes budget decisions. And then um, lastly, although this is just one line and uh, a full page of stuff, this um, took a lot of time, a lot of our discussion actually that had to do with Mr. Ellinger and Mrs. Klein reminded the committee of our current tax rates, millage, expiration dates, and election timelines. And we'll be hearing as a board and much more about that in the very near future, but we spent an extensive amount of time on that discussion and debate, quite frankly. But it was a very, very, very good discussion. So that was it, and there's copy, I'm sure there's copies available of the minutes for this meeting as well as the curriculum and special services one out in the hall for anybody who'd like to pick up a copy. So. Thanks, Rick. Linda, would you like to add anything? No, only that the dates for the elections for our existing tax date rates were all in the resolution that was just read. And you could hear that many of them, it said, went through 2015. You have to remember that the 2015 tax year would actually be the winter 2014 taxes that are collected. But that's one of the things we talked about. Thank you for that point Thank you. So, moving on after two very good reports. Uh, we're moving on to a, our, uh, one of few action items this evening in our technology piece with Mr. Valendi. Still got 6.2. Yes. I'm sorry, did I skip one? Yep. I did. Six. You skipped the gifts, although they're oh. not for action. They're just, in, these are informational. Sorry. Total $6,939.35. Uh, the first is from the Kawasi Kiwanis Foundation, and it's a classroom management carpet. Uh, a beautiful multicolored area rug for Jennifer Suarez's first grade classroom at Carpenter. I had the opportunity to see it last week. And as a former early elementary teacher, I have to say I could appreciate why she wanted it. It's just beautiful, a different color square for every student in the classroom. Uh, really a, a nice addition, and we appreciate that. The Midland Violence Prevention Partnership through the Midland Area Community Foundation provided support for the parent nights that were held at all three middle schools uh, end of September or end of August I believe possibly into the first week in September and these were on the topics of bullying trends with drugs and alcohol cyber safety and supporting students academically at home and topics even beyond that and by all reports these were top-notch events and we had very good uh, feedback from all three buildings. Midland Area Community Foundation also provided some money for the pre-vocational classroom at Dow High School. That's a special education classroom. And then the Dow High School Athletic Booster Club provided funds to purchase a nacho cheese warmer for the community stadium. <laughs> Thank you and, and forgive me for skipping over the Now, Mr. Valendi. I'm okay, sorry. thank you. <clears throat> uh, we have an action item um, which we're asking for uh, approval of a purchase order for 570 second generation iPads and seven MacBook Pros. But before we get to that uh, particular item, we wanted to give you some background. If you remember at the last board meeting, we asked for your approval of a purchase uh, for 50 teacher iPads. Uh, and we talked in general terms about an iPad initiative, uh, which we promised we'd bring to you this time. And along with that comes this recommendation for the purchase of uh, the 570 second generation iPads. You need to understand that uh, we're calling this project iPad, an action research initiative. By action research, we mean um, that we want to see what the promise is of this device. 
We've read the literature. We've talked to districts throughout the state. There are 21 uh, districts throughout the state that are starting one-on-one -on -one iPad initiatives this year alone, uh, many uh, last year. We've talked with uh, uh, districts, large districts uh, down in Texas and other places throughout the United States to get some information on how valuable is this tool and if this tool were to be made available, how do you manage it effectively so that you can support its use on a regular basis while still providing security, while still providing tools that don't distract, but tools that help students learn. And one of the things that we thought of that would be the most valuable before we start going uh, down this path is to have some action research. And by that we mean getting these devices, some of them, uh, in the hands of students, in the hands of teachers, work with parents and colleagues, the IT department, the curriculum division, and find out what it is these can do and how well they can do it and how uh, appropriate is it for different grade levels. So uh, we are collaborating with our teachers who are um, masters of bringing out uh, the best of every tool and knowing how to manage that in a secure environment, in a safe environment. Uh, collaborating with students who will be part of this project, <coughs> uh, parents who will be supporting this project and learning right along with their students. So what we are proposing is an initiative in which we put um, these iPads in the hands of kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders. One entire grade level at each of the different schools. So every elementary school will be involved. We will have um, some action research for how these iPads can be useful in the hands of a kindergartner, a fifth grader, a fourth grader, etc. So at one school, it may be all the fourth graders will get these tools. At another school, it may be all kindergartners will get these schools, and through an application process. So that's the idea, to get them in the hands of students. We're going to get them into hands of teachers earlier so that they can uh, be exploring these devices. And then, uh, before the end of this calendar year, um, ha have those in the classrooms, in those uh, students' hands, in which they can also take them home. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and we can start looking at how valuable they are. And our hope is that we would be having another presentation like this in the spring to share some of our initial observations. OK, I'm going to go to the next slide. Let's start out with a key question first. Not about technology, but <coughs> are we funding this? We are not coming to you with a recommendation for additional funds out of this year's budget. We believe that this is important to do this action research. We believe it strongly enough that we said then we will take a flat uh, tech budget and we will reprioritize projects that we had on the books for this year so that we can take those funds and use it for this action research initiative and hold off on some of the other things so that we didn't have to bring to you any increase in the additional funds. We have brought the uh, same amounts to you in our budget for this year. And this recommendation uh, asks for us to spend our um, regular budgeted amount for this school year. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Sabrin and then Blake Sobel. Thanks, Gary. Um, one of the important parts that I'd like to articulate prior to going into my portion of the presentation is that this initiative and, and thinking about mobile devices in the classroom really is our next step thanks to the expansion of our wireless infrastructure. Um, we spent the remaining portion of the technology grant that we had for the last four or five years on, on the expansion. And thanks to the hard work of Mr. Diedzik and Mr. Pendred and some other key people on Mr. Sobel's team, um, that's going to be a reality for us. And there was quite a bit of interest amongst our teaching colleagues to look at these mobile devices prior to that expansion. But now with that expansion, we're going to be able to really look at what these devices can do for us in, in their entirety 
rather than, say, without an internet connection. So I'd like to begin with what we believe and what we recognize um, in our area uh, as important. We understand the need to equip our, equip our students with technology tools necessary to improve student achievement and remain competitive through the world. These mobile devices, if you look around, and, and you heard me say some of this when I presented the technology plan to you, they're in the hands of almost anybody and everybody, and almost everybody, not quite, but we're getting to the point where our students especially have these devices as part of their world. So to, if we engage them to use those devices, then that will bring increased student achievement as they are engaged in the classroom with those tools that they know how to use. Furthermore, keeping our students competitive through the world, if we keep them using these devices and we keep teaching them, then they'll be leaving us with the knowledge that employers in our area are asking us to ensure that they have upon graduation. Of course, if we're going to have our students learn, we need to allow our teachers to learn too and have the equipment they need to be able to teach the lessons and prepare students for the 21st century workplace. Mobility is key. Teaching and learning occurs beyond the walls of our schools, and Mr. Verlindi touched on this briefly in his introduction. Learning doesn't happen just within our schools. It happens out in the field. It happens with our business connections. It happens um, in, at home as well. And if a student has a device with them all the time, they can have those aha moments or those I get it moments anywhere at the appropriate time when that connection is made, and that's, that's important. Technology, of course, is advancing incredibly fast. There are many statistics out there that show this. Um, and with the expansion of technology, more and more people have these devices readily available to them. Many of our students are what I refer to and what many folks in the literature refer to as digital natives. They are born into this world with, with, uh, uh, with devices that can do jobs for them. And um, in some cases, our youngest students will know nothing other than a touchscreen world. And finally, the importance of maximizing learning opportunities and keeping our students safe. Of course, we understand that we want to maximize everything we can uh, as far as learning goes with our instructional time, but it's also important that we instruct students to be safe in the digital world just like we teach them in the face-to-face -face world. And if we, prov if we have a device with them all the time, that teaching integrates very easily into our day-to-day -day operations in the classroom. So what is it that we are about to embark on? This uh, fall, we are going to put iPads in the hands of approximately 50 teachers, and that group, as Mr. Valindi alluded to, is going to come together and put together, help craft a vision for mobile devices, iOS devices, across the district. And by the end of this year, Midland Public Schools will place just about 570 iPads in the hands of our students. And what's key to this is that we're going to collaborate, and that's important. Teachers, uh, curriculum office, technology areas, um, parents and, and students will come together to decide what is the best way to use these devices to enhance learning and to enhance instruction. And we're also hoping to see if these devices will improve efficiencies for our employees, for the teachers and administrators across the district. As we collaborate and as we come together to have these discussions, there are some key questions that we're hoping to have answered. Will iPads enhance learning, enhance learning and lead to improved test scores? Can these iPads replace the need for computers in, say, our media centers and or potentially interactive whiteboards and some other areas I'd like to add could be handheld recording devices, digital cameras, audience response devices. These mobile devices, these iPads, are all of these separate devices wrapped up into one device. And when you have that power, you can create um, opportunities for students and for teachers that they didn't have before. Or for example, maybe they have to check out from the IMTC and only have for a short period of time. If they have a device such as this, they have that all the time. Now I want to make something clear too for our viewing audience here in the administration building and um, through
through the television station as well. It is not a replacement for media centers. Please note that we're talking about looking at replacement for computers. Um, you know, it could also be a replacement for computer labs as well. If the student has this device, it could eliminate the, the need for a teacher to go sign up for a computer lab because they have the device 100% of the time. Potentially, iPads could replace the need for paper, pencils, and, and textbooks. I don't think paper and pencil will ever be completely obsolete, but uh, the idea of creating something on a device and turning it in, in a digital format, there's a lot of potential for that. And finally, as I mentioned before, could the iPad improve the efficiencies for administrators, teachers, and students? So why would we embark on this journey? Of course, as I've already stated, and Mr. Valindi alluded to as well in his introduction, engagement. I've already mentioned students are engaged. You see them engaged with their electronic devices in many places around our community. Um, I recently saw a graphic in some of my research um, looking at statistics for college students. And a high percentage of college student use with their mobile devices is for communicating, collaborating, finding what they need for their classwork, getting their information on if you know, traffic is busy if they're traveling to class or if they are researching and so on. Very low percentage was for uh, gaming and, and entertainment. Relevance and critical thinking activities can be created all of the time, seamlessly through the day, because these devices are available to students all the time. I've already mentioned, no more waiting for the computer lab to be available. When teachers have the ability to create such relevant and critical thinking activities. Really, in my opinion, we're doing um, a great job in preparing students for those jobs that we don't know are going to exist yet. And furthermore, giving them those thinking skills to solve those problems that we don't know are problems yet either. We've already touched a little bit on collaboration and communication. If they have a device in their hand, this collaboration and communication can occur at any time and at anywhere when students have the equipment at hand, and as well as the, the data connection, hence the, my comments earlier about the wireless network across the district. Creativity. And to me, this is one of the most important parts of why we're embarking on this, on this uh, adventure. Kids need to be able to create their projects, their content, in other ways than, say, traditional paper and pencil. Students, in some cases, in some of my conversations, are asking for that. They're asking for ways to present research or papers, maybe in a video format, or in some other digital format that we don't know about in this room that they may find or may come up with on their own. When they can be creative through alternative mediums, our students are going to be more engaged, and they will hold on to that knowledge longer and have a deeper understanding. All these bring, come together into 21st century learning still, skills that we've talked about in Midland Public Schools quite a bit recently. Now, it's not all of the 21st century learning skills from an instructional standpoint. These are the five that I've picked out that I thought would be most positively affected through students having a mobile device. Of course, there's other reasons why we're doing this. To promote dig digital citizenship. Um, Previously in the gifts section, you heard about the presentations at the middle school. I was involved in the um, um, uh, cyber safety component. And this is a topic that's near and, near and dear to me where we need to continually teach our students about being respectful and responsible in the digital world, just like in the face-to-face -face world. If students have these devices all the time, that instruction can happen seamlessly through the day. Of course, project-oriented learning and inquiry-based learning can happen automatically when the devices are there, no more waiting for the computer lab. I listed off some devices earlier that um, such an iPad or mobile device could, could replace, and I just put on the screen, timely response to instruction. If you think of the audience response devices, there's um, resources out there where a teacher could use an iPad to get that immediate feedback from students, either through apps to use or through Moodle, watching students take a quiz on Moodle 
and get that immediate feedback through their device while they're teaching. Of course, up-to-date resources, and the first thing that come to many people's minds are the um, electronic textbooks. Um, and then also there's all the websites and all the apps that are designed to share information. And finally, assistive technology for our special needs students. Quite a few apps out there to help um, students hear their reading back to them, some apps to help them actually talk for them if needed, and, and so on. So who will this initiative involve? The primary focus for this initiative, as we've already mentioned, is grades K through five, our elementary buildings, with some special services sections at the middle school level. And as Mr. Valindi alluded to, there is an application process, and it's being used to determine which grade levels at which buildings will receive the iPads with the idea that we will involve all seven of our elementary buildings. Um, and to be selected, teachers have to participate together as a team and as early adopters. And that's a really important piece. When teachers participate in this, uni in this initiative, they need to understand there's going to be celebrations and there's going to be pitfalls. <laughs> we don't know this is a journey. This is an adventure. It's just that. In our discussions with other districts who are um, embarking on the same adventure, they don't have all the, question, all the answers to the questions either. And so I'm eager about this component, and I'm eager to see what we're going to learn as we go. And these teachers will receive their device early in October, giving them an opportunity to explore, try it out, do some planning prior to uh, the device being um, deployed out to students. So how are we going to handle all of this? At this time, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Blake Sobel, Director of Technology. Thanks, Chris. Chris has done an excellent job of explaining why it's important for our district to embark on such a journey um, and to put these newer technologies in the hands of our teachers and our students. Let me spend a little bit of time talking to you about how we're actually going to do that, all the moving parts in order to make this work. First, we're going to go ahead and start off by purchasing approximately 570 second generation iPads. We say approximately at this point because right now we're waiting for the applications to come in. Once we receive the applications and select the sections that will be part of this initiative, we'll know exactly how many student devices we need to support that. We're receiving a volume discount from Apple by buying these devices in packs of 10. Um, so we actually get those devices at $379 per device versus the $399 that everybody else pays. And it's also important to understand that future projects may actually involve um, the, the um, much anticipated however yet to be uh, confirmed iPad mini. Uh, the iPad mini is rumored to provide a, um, a seven inch tablet, basically a smaller solution for our smaller students, a smaller price point, um, in addition to smaller replacement costs um, and something better for possibly our K through two kids. Each iPad is going to be accompanied by a military duty case with a screen protector. <laughs> Investing in a high quality case up front is going to pay dividends in the long run. Um, when we talk about repairs and replacement, this is something that we would like to self-fund for the purposes of this initiative. Uh, detailed guidelines will be released at the time of deployment, which basically will explain um, who's going to be responsible for what throughout this project. The numbers that we've set aside that you'll see later on basically assume 15% replacement cost for the devices that are part of this project. Uh, keep in mind that we will only have those devices in circulation for a little over half a year, and so the 15% of the uh, 620 devices that we're looking at, uh, we shouldn't really achieve that 15%. We may elect to go with third-party options in the future. Uh, there are companies out there that will provide uh, insurance coverage for these devices whether we're looking at two years worth of coverage or three years worth of coverage, and then varying premium uh, or deductible options. What we really need to do before we make a decision on whether we continue to self-fund the iPads um, or go with a third party is we need to determine what that total cost of ownership looks like in order for us to manage it as a team within the technology department um, in order to determine how we handle any of those claims and what that looks like versus letting a third party handle that for us. So that's something we will be evaluating as we move through, the, through this project. 
students will be allowed to take the device home for this project. Uh, they will be responsible for keeping it safe and keeping it charged. And we will ask that all parents or guardians sign an iOS uh, device user agreement prior to allowing that student to take the device home. Uh, again, we use iOS uh, here as opposed to iPad simply because it allows us some flexibility in the future if we do decide to invite um, the iPad mini into this discussion. And that particular user agreement will explain in greater detail what Midland Public Schools will be responsible for and what the parents, uh, the students, and the families will be responsible for. It's also important to understand that these district issued iPads will be filtered. So whether that device is being used by a student within our network or off site at home um, in a restaurant, wherever, it will be filtered in compliance with uh, SIPA using a third party browser or potentially taking advantage of some upgrades to the Apple operating system that will come out here uh, within the next few months. Uh, basically what SIPA is is the uh, Children's Internet Protection Act which addresses concerns about children's access uh, to obscene and harmful content over the internet. Teachers and administrators will work collaboratively to develop what we're referring to as app sets. App sets will be defined uh, by grade level and include multiple subject areas. And what the app sets do is basically allow us to use the Apple configurator uh, software in order to define profiles for students. And so what we're able to do with that software is create these profiles which may contain uh, profiles, say, for third grade students and multiple subject areas. And we take that profile and we push it out to the device. It also allows us, uh, through this particular configuration, to retain ownership of these apps. Uh, we basically are going to be able to push them out from one year to the next as opposed to gifting the apps out to the students and then having to uh, continue uh, to address that cost from year to year. Another thing that's worth mentioning about the Apple configurator is that it also allows us to remove the App Store and iTunes from the device, eliminating the uh, possibility for uh, games and apps that don't provide assistance with instruction that could provide potential distractions uh, throughout the school day. We can keep those things off the device using that particular software. Uh, AirWatch is going to be used as our primary piece of mobile device management software. Uh, we'll be able to use this in order to uh, manage the devices as they come into our network. We'll also be able to push out what's called web clips, which are basically shortcuts that live on your home screen to particular websites uh, that teachers may be using within the classroom. And the advantage to using AirWatch is that we can push those out over the air as opposed to requiring the students to actually sync that device. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that um, in the next slide. It also allows us to remote wipe the device in the case uh, it, it comes up lost or stolen. Each building will also receive, um, uh, that's participating in this program, will also receive a sync station and a MacBook Pro to manage the devices. And so the MacBook Pro is what's going to run iTunes. It's what's going to run Apple Configurator. It's what's going to allow us to manage those profiles. Each of these particular sync stations then will live at each of these buildings. And then either the students with their teachers or their, uh, we're actually uh, in the process of evaluating some different options for how we would get those devices to the sync station in order to apply the updates to the profiles, which along with that includes updates to the apps and things of that nature. Some of those solutions do include carts, which you see in the slide here. Um, other solutions do not include the carts, which may provide us a more mobile solution. So let's talk about the total cost associated with the project. We're looking at 570 iPads with protective cases uh, for $235,980. The seven sync stations, uh, which are totaling $17,640. The MacBook Pros to accompany those sync stations uh, for a total of $7,455 for a total of $261,075. Now I bring this next item in because we do have to set aside funds for the repair and replacement part of this project. Uh, assuming the 15% replacement of the total device uh, leaves us at $37,107. Are there any questions? Yeah, like, um, I think it's really, really well thought out. 
I'm looking at the, the next year. So let's say you pick the fourth grade at Chestnut Hill this year. What is your thought about next year? Does it go to the fifth grade at Chestnut Hill? Does it stay in the fourth grade? Or is that to be determined based on your experience this year? Uh, that's to be determined based on what we learned through this initial uh, initiative. John. Oh, I was going to say, is there is there any parent responsibility when they take them home? You said there'd be something that they sign, but you know, if a child loses one, you know how like when you have a book, yes, and they charge us if something happens to the book, will there be something like that with this iPad? The details of those particular guidelines and what we'll be responsible for, what the families, and the parents, the students will be responsible for, will be detailed in those guidelines, which will be made available. Uh, before we issue any of those iPads. Okay. We're still in the process of crafting the language that will go in those guidelines, but it will be available shortly. Okay. Jonathan, could you give me an example, you know, with the one-to-one -one computing, because that's what this is. What are some, let's say, what's the most exciting idea, just as an example, that is, uh, a teacher uh, has been the most excited about as far as how it can revolutionize the classroom? I mean, just as an, an example. As right now there's a... There's assessments because you can test them and you know determine where they're at with a with a skill or a subject but just kind of curious as a real world example like what's can I share one Chris why you're Foster? stepping up there John yeah uh, um, Jeff Lauer had shared with me I, I mean we do dibbling around the elementary grades I mean mm -hmm. pretty common term here a lot of our parents and certainly our teachers and mm -hmm. paraprofessionals are aware of it apparently there is an app for dibbling that allows wow. the kids to be using the iPad that would give the teacher essentially instant feedback and not have to, if I understand this right, individually grade that and take the time to do it. They could get some real-time feedback. Mm -hmm. When some of our elementary staff found out about that, my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Van Lindy, um, some of our teachers got pretty excited about how can I get one? And of course, their answer was convince your other third or fourth grade teachers as part of your team. I, I to would get equally add, excited. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I great. would add um, a story that I heard uh, last spring, and at one of our elementary schools. Many of you are familiar. You visited uh, the wax museum projects <clears throat> that are done in the elementary, in which students dress up as their characters. They have uh, usually some kind of poster, etc., about that character. But then they talk in the um, language of that character and answer questions as if they are that character. So anyway, at one of our elementary schools last year, we have a student um, who uh, had a uh, physical disability and really was not able to speak correctly. Um, he's faced this challenge uh, for a number of years. But what was the most amazing thing from everybody that was there at the time is he did his wax museum, he had his iPad, and when somebody would ask him a question, he would type in the answer very quickly, and it was then generated back as a voice very similar to the, the character uh, that uh, he was portraying. That's a powerful tool in the case of assistive technology. And I think um, in reading and language arts, in math and social studies, we can find uh, some really powerful apps. And we can't underestimate the um, wisdom of our teachers. They will find things that we hadn't even thought of. And I was just going to touch on the mobility component. Um, the mobility component where you may not be just tied to a computer at your desk. With the Wi-Fi across all the instructional areas, you can get up, you can walk around your classroom, you can be at a student, you can be right there with the student working with them one-to-one -one or with a group of students and you can easily take this device rather than having to be plugged into a wall or, yes, I know this sounds silly, I never thought I would say what I'm about to say, but carry a heavy laptop around. I mean, let's face it, I mean, the iPad is a lot easier to get around. But also, um, the apps that are out there provide those vicarious experiences that in some cases we can't provide. For example, there's a, uh, an app that I have found that has real-time um, video cameras at various zoos around the country and in some cases around the world. So if you're studying various animals, you can see them in their habitat right there at that time. Um, a final component is, is really the software evaluation system that we have in place right now it doesn't apply when it comes to the iPad component. So if there's an app out there that a teacher could use, really it comes down to the cost and, and we have some ideas in place on the volume purchasing and so on and so forth. But uh, my understanding, and I'm kind of going into Blake's area here a little bit, 
uh, so forgive me. Um, you know, if if there's something that if there's an idea that's there, we can pursue it a whole lot more quickly than with our with all the different software vendors that are out there right now. It's one software vendor. It's called the iTunes Store. So, cool. That's, that's I think exciting. it's fair to recognize also that. I mean, there's over a half a million apps um, that are out there, educational apps that you can purchase. We wouldn't be here to tell you that every one of those are quality, which is why I like the idea of a pilot program because it gives our teachers who are closest to the instruction the opportunity to kind of sift through that. I mean, look at their journals or recommend good apps. Try some of them out. There's an opportunity for, his, for us to put our toes tepidly in the water and say, does this do what we think it might before we make a full-scale jump? Great. It's exciting. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to <coughs> take the lead on summarizing uh, a little bit. First of all, I'd like to thank Gary and, and Blake and Chris. Uh, what an outstanding pr presentation and um, pr some pretty good insight, uh, at least from uh, a more recent iPad uh, user uh, uh, as to what that capability is and what that means for our students in, the, in our classroom and, it's, and specifically our teaching staff. Um, I think it's important to note to the public, and I'm sure Roger ca captured that, that there was no additional cost to the budget. This was a, re um, a, a realignment of sorts within our technology budget, I'm not asking for any more dollars from the board, uh, staying within that budget, but just prioritizing things differently uh, given uh, what we feel is a, a new trend and, and a new adventure for, for education and, and for our district. And so I wanted to point, out, point that out. Um, I had several questions beginning at, at the beginning of your presentation, and uh, all, all of those have been answered. And I, you know, it goes back to Angela's question about um, the responsibility of parents and the students, and I think that um, as we move forward, it'll be a work in progress, and uh, that may be a, you, we may see that amended <laughs> at some point. I'm sure we will, um, but I'm really encouraged by the work that's been done, and I'm impressed by the professionalism that all, all three of you and the, and the team that's part of who you are um, brought this to us tonight. So I'm uh, I'm pleased at the outcome, and uh, again, I'm uh, I, you know I I like how we stepped back from what were some of our priorities and reprioritized and. Uh, I think it's a great tool. With that, <clears throat> for action, I'll bring to you a uh, recommendation uh, to approve a, a purchase order to Apple uh, Incorporated of Cupertino, California for up to $224,000. That PO won't go out till after the uh, um, applications have uh, been selected and we have an exact number, but we're, we're certain that that should cover it for up to 570 second generation iPads and the seven uh, uh, MacBook Pros. And Apple, of course, is a sole source provider here, and this is out of our regular uh, budgeted um, funds for this coming year. I'll move approval. Support. Moved by Mr. Oli, supported by Dr. Kaminsky. Any other questions or comments? Can I just make a comment here because I'm 110% supportive of this and, and this is part of our long discussion that we had at FFO. Um, we, need to, we need to continue to invest in technology, obviously in a significant way long term, and we've got to figure out how we're going to fund that. This is, like Carol said, getting our feet wet. This is 570. We've got, you know, 8,000 plus students or whatever the number is. So we've got to think about how we're going to continue to grow this, how we're going to continue to support it and sustain it in an operational way because we talk about the operational dollars there. So the more investment you make, the more impact it has in terms of our operational budget as well. So that's just a challenge for all of us, or I guess everybody, but Ken and I going down the road. This is something we all believe very strongly in, but it comes with a cost. And we all believe very strongly there's a high return on investment, but we've got to figure out how to do that long term. So I just kind of, kind of a challenge that we all have in front of us. And I think that will be an important challenge that uh, that will be part of the um, more near future discussions than we realize with respect to what this district needs to do as far as Absolutely. supporting technology and other um, capital improvements to maintain what we have and to quite honestly compete in, in this in this educational environment. Uh, just to have to look around us and not very far to find out that there's a lot of districts uh, amping up their technology use and, and that's um, if, it, if in keeping with our mission and vision with respect to world-class educational experience in this district um, this is the uh, first small step that we need to take in order to effectively make that change happen. And uh, 
but it, Rick hit it right on the head that operational costs will be critical uh, to support this. And so just know that um, at some point in the future that discussion will take place and uh, the entire community will have an opportunity to, to evaluate the, important, uh, the importance of this and how this affects their students and, and their educational experience. So thanks, Rick. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, we have a motion on the table with support. All those in favor of the technology request signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your technology request. And thank you again, gentlemen, for all your hard work and your support staff that was, uh, to help make that happen. So, that was good. I like that. I like <laughs> at the end of the meeting, that's really <laughs> positive. Um, correspondence to and from the Board of Education is in your agenda. And the regular scheduled activities, and for our two candidates who are in the room, we invite you to participate uh, for the rest of the year. Um, and the remaining, uh, there will be some pretty good meetings left yet this year for s September through December. And with that, uh, we'll start with study discussion. And to my right with Mr. Oley. Yeah, I just wanted to congratulate everybody um, from my vantage point anyways. Um, something we've got off to a great start. Um, so I just want to thank all the leadership here and all the building um, leaders and uh, all the teachers for getting us to a great start this year. I want to thank everybody for the, for the gifts. It's a good start to the year. Um, I also want to kind of thank Scott and Joyce for being two of the four board candidates that are here tonight. I know there's a lot of ways to prepare for board service, and certainly coming to board meetings is one of those ways. So thanks for taking the time to come up and um, be here tonight. Um, and just a reminder, I'm going to be out of the country for our next board meeting, so I will not be here on the 24th. So that's all I got. Dr. Kaminsky. Um, my thoughts were pretty simple tonight um, with a good start to the year uh, the way we did our back to school um, meeting at Central Auditorium that was that was really great um, a great start to the year um, you know I felt the MPS family um, coming together getting off to a good start and just um, the professionalism of our teachers administrators after a pretty tough uh, end of uh, last year is just very much appreciated and uh, we're getting the job done. Uh, we're keeping in mind, most importantly, the students and not letting them down and making sure the job gets done. And I'm just very appreciative that all that can occur and get off to such a good start. Very appreciative. Mrs. Baker. I would echo the same thing as I was driving around the last couple of days. And the weather's been great for the beginning of school. You know, kids outside and a lot of buzz and, and uh, a lot of activity going on. I was a little melancholy last Tuesday for, since I didn't send anybody off and I didn't have anybody come home excited about what was going on at school. So, um, Your husband doesn't count, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but uh, my daughter at, at Michigan State uh, was having a grand time, but she doesn't report in, so I really don't know. So. And you don't want her to. <laughs> um, and just uh, thanks to uh, Chris and Blake. I, I like how you break that down, and it was it was nice to understand and see what we're doing because I know technology moves so quickly, and it's amazing. And um, when you talk about preparing for the future and it's the wave, I know when Sarah, I, I, a few times I did talk to her, you know, it, it, at college level even, so many of the syllabuses and, and the work and everything they do is it's their responsibility, and it's on, it's on a computer or whatever it might be. So... Um, it's going to be interesting to see as we move forward our, how our younger generation is, is going to, this is going to, the wave of the future. Um, and I guess the other thing is I had the, the privilege of being over in Mount Pleasant on Saturday, as I think some other people did. And, and uh, what a treat to see you know, some of our own graduates, Andrew Maxwell, Connor Gagnon, and, and I'm sure there's others involved in, in their numerous waves. But a lot of parents, a lot of MPS students, and uh, it was just a, a neat um, event that was just so close to home here and seeing how people, even at the college level, you know, are pulling together. And school's important, whether it's through um, academics, technology, or, or the sports. And it was, it was just great to see a great sportsmanship, um, you know, at a, in a university setting. So on that note, I hope everybody enjoys the next couple weeks and before we're back here again. Angela. All right. Well, we're off to a great start at the Brandstadt House. No one's held back on giving homework. <laughs> Tonight's question is, what is science? <laughs> so, um, and I'm very excited about the iPads. 
I know my children are going to be very disappointed that it's only in the elementary school, so hopefully we can <laughs> push that forward um, in future years. And um, I guess on a sad note, and I'm sure Gary will probably do this next time, but I saw in the paper tonight that my fifth grade teacher passed away, Ms. Mrs. Lorton. So um, anyway, that was sad to see that. She was my fifth grade teacher and my sixth grade math teacher. So that is all. Well, I also want to thank you for your presentation. I learned a lot from that. That was great. Um, I really liked what you said about preparing our students to become digital citizens. That's the world they're going to live in. And certainly, teachers have taught and students have learned for years and years in many different ways. And part of our responsibility, I think, or a good share of our responsibility is to prepare them for the world they're going to live in. So I think it's great. I'm really excited about it. So thank you very much for being here. And then I just want to uh, wish everybody a great year good uh, teaching year, a good learning year, and I hope all the students are as excited about it as I am. I think it's a great adventure every year is, so that's it. Thank you all. Um, it was a great year, uh, our gate launched this new school year on the, on the first day back on Thursday. Um, uh, there was a lot of buzz in the air, and it seemed to be a lot of enthusiasm. Um, Mr. Ellinger picked a great speaker, uh, our guest speaker. Um, um, some real moments of humor that uh, are often needed at the beginning of such a, a task each year uh, that's before us, and that uh, that being this new school year. I'd like to um, make a comment that with respect to the FFO and the CASA uh, committees, uh, I think too often um, people in the community think that we meet twice a month here um, on Mondays, the second and the fourth Monday of each month. And don't realize that the work that's put in the uh, and the efforts put, that's put in by board members, and I'm not blowing or, or, or tooting our own horn, um, but everybody that participates in this on this board is on a committee. And it, uh, uh, one of Rick's, I, I, I sort of smile when Rick said a lot of uh, good debate and uh, discussion goes around a lot of the de decisions that they bring forward to this entire board, um, and I just want to. Uh, say thank you to both groups for your your hard work and uh, great reports this, uh, this evening and knowing that uh, Rick and I will be stepping down in a few short months uh, and seeing that progress happen and that uh, interaction take place behind the scenes uh, is very important to me because that's what makes us successful as a board and makes this district uh, successful as a district and having those discussions and asking the hard questions and having that discussion so thank you again uh, on a lighter note, um, what a great start for the school year. Um, no, nothing bad. Uh, we get emails, and I think I've talked to Cindy almost every day since the beginning of school. Um, and so that's part of being board president for those of you who have, may have an interest in the future. Um, but uh, a great, great start to the school year, and I'm, I'm excited. Uh, a lot of the positive things that are happening, and I can't just I can just imagine what the three of you are going to receive with respect to applications for the the opportunity to be part of this new 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 uh, iPad uh, um, piece, and I, I I can't imagine some of the ideas that might come forward, and I'm I'm excited to s listen to what some of our teaching staff will, will present to all of you. So, thank you again, and with that, Mr. Ellinger. Three items, all fairly brief. I concur. Um, I had one goal for the uh, start of the school year, and that was, after going through uh, two years of an unsettled labor contract. <coughs> And I actually heard this from a couple of teachers. It didn't dawn on them until later in the day on that Tuesday that we started after what I thought was a very good meeting like John um, over in the auditorium. It didn't dawn on these teachers till later, you know, what, what they used to feel like back uh, last um, spring, late last spring, because it was such a positive start to the school year. That was the common theme from our guest speaker, from our uh, Midland City Education Association union president, from me, uh, if we didn't hit a home run, I think we hit a triple. And uh, from wandering around the district, you could tell. Uh, I think that's what people were ready to hear was a unifying message. So that was very positive. I think some of us have been living off that um, experience for a few days. Um, secondly is, um, I just mentioned this to you. Linda caught this in the uh, September 12th food, fan uh, food Pantry Network news. They alluded to something that we talked about last spring, and that is for... Jefferson Middle School, those students collected over 500 items for Sam's Pantry 
this past spring. That's pretty impressive, and I think it shows the caring student body that we have here. And that's just one example of 12, building, 12 buildings. But a shout out to the Jefferson Middle School staff and those students, as well as the food pantry for drawing this kind of partnership to our community's attention. Again, I thought was worthy of another mention tonight. Um, thank you to Joyce Perry and to Scott McFarland. They're in the audience. Uh, they're running for the Board of Education. You know, attending meetings like this, I think, puts you in a position to really understand the roles, responsibilities, and the time commitment that it takes to do this job. Um, some people have heard me say this. Uh, a lot of Board of Educations pay themselves so much per meeting to uh, do this job. I don't think the board here ever has. And I know these uh, six folks before you tonight have never gone down that path. So that says something about their commitment and the history of how people in this community step up in service uh, to the children that we all feel fortunate to serve. So thank you to the two of you being here. I reached out to all four candidates offering to meet with them uh, so they can understand those three uh, things um, even better uh, than you think you may already. Uh, Scott and I have met, uh, I think, uh, meeting with Kim Vanderkellen tomorrow, and if it works out for Joyce and the other young lady who's running, we'd be happy to make time to do that as well. So please take advantage of that. I think you would find it helpful. And then a last reminder, uh, just for the board at your place, are the calendar of events that's coming up for the rest of uh, this month. Um, feel free to attend any and all of them. Um, uh, you're very busy people, but you're always welcome at these events which is why we give you an update of those every two weeks throughout the school year. So with that, that's it. With that, unless there's something further, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So move moved by Mr. Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Mr. Oley. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Motion carried.